We're going through open systems now. We'll do this uh, now and we'll hit the last of it with a couple. Uh, where did that come from? <laughs> Imagine any reason they put a 
a fan or something like that in one of these. Uh, and again, typically, since they're pretty small, you can assume delta P is zero. Now, uh, because of the change in speed, delta Ke is not zero. What you have to watch for is the possibility that one of the flow velocities is negligible compared to the other one, and that's you can assume that flow velocity is zero. Uh, could be the case with a nozzle where the inlet flow velocity could be considered negligible, and you can just set that to zero. Um, if it's drawing from ambient air, that's generally uh, typically what we assume. <coughs> But if you have enough information, if you've got the inlet area and uh, pressure and the like, you probably can figure out the velocity. So if you can figure it out, don't assume it's negligible just because uh, you think you have other things to work on. Practical jokes. You said K, delta K was not equal to zero? What's it say? Right there. Just make sure. Yeah, well, you didn't sit so far away, you'd see better. Okay. Now, I don't, I don't mean to get mad at you, Paul. You're one of the few I still like in here after this morning. So, Paul, Taylor, and Nate, John. That's pretty much it. Phil, Phil stumbled into it, but then thought, hey, this is kind of cool. I think I'll stick around. I was too afraid to grab the handle again. <laughs> Mingle got in and out. You could get in and out. He just kicked his way in. Yeah. All right. Anyway, enough of that. So those are the specific details you can use to start reducing that uh, work energy energy equation to uh, doable forms. Turbines, pumps. And compressors. And we're going to need to be able to do these individually pretty well because we're going to be putting them together into entire power systems and uh, we can't spend time figuring out uh, how to do each of these little pieces as we put them all together. <coughs> Generally turbines are for gases and vapors. Uh, though there are liquid turbines as well, that's certainly the type of turbine that you find on, uh, on, a, on a hydroelectric pump plant, a uh, hydroelectric dam. Pumps, though, exclusively for liquids, doesn't mean that the, the um, doesn't mean that there might not be some combination of, uh, of those, especially with turbines. What we'll find with turbines is the high energy steam generally comes in in the turbine in superheat, but is de-energized so much as that uh, energy is turned into work that the outlet conditions in the turbine could actually fall to underneath the dome, meaning that the steam is very, very wet. There's actual liquid content to that steam, which can be quite destructive to the turbine because of the very high velocities often in turbines with actual water droplets in the stream, it can uh, erode the turbine blades uh, rather quickly. So there's a, a big effort made to generally keep the outlet of the turbine from falling under the dome and or protecting the, the blades from that. Um, turbines, the purpose of them is to produce work. I can't think of any uh, other instance in which we have a, a turbine running other than to produce work. What's done with that work? Well, there's lots of possibilities. Uh, generally for power plants, they're connected to electric generators. And uh, then that's sent down the line to, the, to the, wherever it's to be used. Generally, pumps and compressors, the point of those 
is to pressurize the fluid stream. Low temperature in, or low pressure in, much higher pressure out. It could very well be the case that uh, there is heat transfer, but uh, you just have to read the problem for what it says. It could say an 80 bat of turbine, then you know there's no heat transfer. It could be that not, not enough information is given to find the heat transfer. Um, all compressors, however, do consume work. They, you cannot pressurize a fluid by uh, use of pumps and compressors without having them plugged into something. transfer but uh, not guaranteed so we're going to be looking at, at uh, turbines and compressors quite a bit as we go through some of the problems because they play a huge part in uh, power plant analysis nozzles and diffusers aren't nearly as common in power plants but most certainly turbines uh, depending on the type of power plant, might have a, a pump or a compressor, but certainly have a turbine. Throttling valves are nothing more than constrictions in the flow. They can be just a simple narrowing, uh, but it can also be a, a, the type of valve you see in your in your in your. Uh, Plumbing at home. Often no moving parts whatsoever. Uh, very often no maintenance or anything. Um, purpose of which is to depressurize the flow. Doesn't doesn't mean drive to zero pressure. Doesn't mean reduce the pressure greatly for whatever reason. Um, what can happen then is what's called flashing, where the pressure is so low that the uh, the fluid uh, the gases in the fluid start to come out, or it actually starts to vaporize. Maybe the purpose, maybe not. Generally, very small generally not a significant increase in the flow speed. There could be in the actual constriction itself, but generally it's not so great that this becomes uh, significant. And there's no flow, uh, no heat transfer, no work being done in a, in a throttling valve. And I think we went over that a little bit uh, before on Wednesday, what that reduces to then is nothing more than the enthalpy is a constant in flow through a throttling valve. So for that reason, if nothing else, they should be one of your favorites. Since 
the enthalpy is a constant and enthalpy is defined as U plus PV. What's going on here then is the internal energy tends to drop greatly through a um, throttling valve and the flow energy tends to increase by quite a bit. So it's, it's that increase in flow energy that allows these things to, to work, even though the pressure is dropping. The product of the PV is not, not that that's the point necessarily, but that's what it does. Okay, we'll also be looking at, at mixing chambers. You've got a lot of experience with these. I don't know if anybody has a home steam turbine, but everybody has a home mixing chamber. When you adjust the temperature on the shower, you're bringing in a little bit of cold air, a little bit of warm air, and it mixes into a single stream. Okay. So it's the combination. Oh, you, what, you don't take showers? Of air. Did I say air? Yeah, a little bit of warm yeah. air, a little bit of cold air. Yeah. I don't get it. You never listen to me, ever, unless I say something wrong, then you jump all over it. Get out of class question. <laughs> Alan, how soon are you getting out of class? That's the question. It's the combination of air. Combination of two or more streams into one. typically of the same fluid. Yeah, dry cleaning. It's a air. Yeah. Combination of air. Yeah. Combination of air. Hot air and hot air and cold air. And then you you dry clean. Uh, often with these the overall heat transfer is zero, no work being done. There might be some kind of mechanical aid to the mis mixing, some kind of fan or paddle stirring it, but uh, generally not. If so, then the work isn't zero. Um, if, uh, if the temperature of the mixing, average temperature is significantly different than ambient, there could be heat transfer, but not generally, not often. Usually, these things aren't very big and the flow areas are such that the uh, kinetic energy changes aren't very great. So what this comes down to is nothing more than the inlet, flow, en the energy flowing into the chamber is equal to the energy flowing out of the chamber by whatever inlets and outlets there may be. Typically there's only one outlet, but there might be more than one inlet. It's a, actually a type of heat exchanger because the warm stream um, is offering up heat to the cool stream until they come out as a single stream of a single temperature. Uh, the uh, inlet and outlet pressures are typically as well the same. Otherwise, it, it might be more at the inlet then at the outlet to get flow to go from the inlet to the outlet, you'd never have higher pressure at the outlet than at the inlet because then you get backflow. 
Better fix this before Alan jumps on it. It says out. That's what I have. Preemptive. That's what I wrote. What would what, you think it said? Or what did you think? I don't know. I'm worried about what you thought it said. What did I? What did I don't know. Did you think I? I don't know. What you thought I, I thought don't know. <laughs> Heat exchangers uh, serve the purpose of a hot stream releases heat to a cool stream. Now, it's not necessarily that's the specific purpose, or it's, it, it could be that we're trying to cool down the hot stream as the purpose. It could be that we're trying to heat up the cool stream as the purpose. It could be that it's both. But no matter what, there's uh, still going to be heat transfer from one hot stream to another with no mixing of the two streams. If the streams do mix, then we have a mixing chamber instead. That being said, I'll declare that there's no heat transfer. Mm -hmm. There's no overall heat transfer, usually for a, a heat exchanger. There's, of course, heat transfer from one stream to the other, but not from the heat exchanger to the ambient, or vice versa. Usually there's no mixing uh, apparatus, uh, aid of any kind, so no work is being done. And so what this comes down to uh, for analysis purposes is that whatever heat transfer there is from one of the streams goes only in to the other stream. So that's as simple a way to put it if we, if we need one. Uh, however, the, the details become clearer when you get to the problem itself. So you might have wording something like a, an adiabatic uh, heat exchanger with such and such, and then you can put that together. This very same um, equation here then, of course, applies with that situation. That whatever energy comes into the system goes out in the flow itself. The last of the open systems it's just simple duct or pipe flow. Essentially, these are really no different than uh, the analysis on uh, uh, diffusers or nozzles, other than the fact that uh, the cross-sectional flow area is constant. But not always. As with any of these things, not always anything can be put into the problem that screws the whole thing up. And the whole day is a waste, which it kind of is anyway. Thanks to physics students. Usually quite small, no work being done. Usually no heat transfer. However, that's not necessarily the case. If it's a very long pipe, it may be such that the purpose is to either uh, add heat to that stream or take stream away. But that's kind of like just looking at one half of the heat exchanger um, and uh, leaving it at that. Typically, not very big. Typically, um, not much 
change in the flow velocity, how, uh, especially if the uh, area is constant. However, you could certainly imagine that we have uh, a tube and a boiler, and if enough heat is coming in, that the liquid that comes into one end of the pipe then starts to boil and by the time it comes out the density is greatly reduced the specific volume is much much higher and since m dot equals rho a v AV over specific volume. If the density goes way down and the area is constant, then the velocity is going to go way up. And uh, you can see the same thing in that other part. So if there's an actual change in phase in a constant area pipe or duct, then there can be a huge change in the, uh, in the flow velocity. So there's a, there's a little compendium of uh, generalities that go with our open system analysis that will help you read through the problem, start with the uh, first law, and reduce it to where all you got to do is finish the problem. So none of the problems in this chapter should take more than about 45 seconds or so to do. I think the whole chapter will take you about 10 minutes to completely finish. If you're taking more than that, then maybe uh, drop out. Just can't cut it. Okay. All right, we'll look at some of these. We'll set some of these up so that uh, your uh, your the, 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 the brief periods where you're actually sober over spring break, you can do some problems. We looked at a couple on Wednesday. We'll look at a couple more now. You gotta just carefully read through the problem because generally in there are the words you need that say what goes to zero. If there's enough words, I guess the whole problem would go to zero. What now? Back there? I hate the students that sit back in the back corner. They're always the worst. <laughs> Man, they're just trouble from the get-go. Alright, so let's see some of the problems we can, uh, we can digest. <laughs> Okay, chapter five. Lots of problems because spring break's right in the middle, so you have nothing else to do. I know you guys. That's why uh, you have enough free time on your hands to do bad things to elderly people. Disgusting, that is it. Okay, let's see some of these we can look at. Oh, for, uh, for example, uh, I think number 23. Yeah, 23 is one that doesn't actually sound like it's one of our open systems, but uh, you're to treat it as such. 23 is about a pressure cooker. Uh, I don't know if anybody's ever used one. The, the purpose of a pressure cooker is it's, it's a, almost a closed system such that um, as, as the water in it starts to boil, the pressure goes way up, then the temperature can go quite up above boiling point. So instead of uh, cooking food in a chamber that's limited to 212 degrees, as it, as it would be if you just boiled it on your stove in an open pot, go to much higher pressures, much higher boiling points, and then much faster cooking in a, in a pressure vessel. But uh, of course it requires uh, uh, a system that can actually hold that pressure so you actually have to clamp the lid down on top of it and then for safety sake there is a 
pressure release valve in there. So when the pressure reaches a certain point, then it starts to vent steam to uh, keep the pressure at a, a, now at a safe level. It's well over ambient pressure, but well under the bursting pressure of the, uh, of the pot itself. Um, in fact, in strength of materials, we'll kind of look at that sort of thing a little bit. So, so uh, what you're given is that uh, it, uh, you're told that it's observed that an amount of liquid in the cooker decreases by 0.6 gallons in 45 minutes. So you can use that to help you find the flow rate through the valve, assuming that at least for a short period of time there's there's uh, that the valve itself serves as our open system, and that's where you're to look at the problem. Don't look at the uh, the whole pot itself as as an open system, which, well, I guess it is with one outlet. It's an open system, but that would be a system and a, a, a transient analysis problem, where we're doing steady state analysis problems for all of these. So on 23, you have to assume. Uh, assume a couple things uh, as usual that the specific volume of the liquid is at the uh, saturated end of, uh, of the dome and the specific volume of the vapor, vapor is G. That's what you need most because that's going to determine the flow, the flow rate. And you're supposed to actually come up with, the, I think, the velocity. Oh, a couple things. Mass flow rate, exit velocity, total and flow energies per system unit mass. Remember that uh, the term flow energy is that... Uh, system, but it, it really is, a, you need to look at the, the valve itself, really, is the flow, the, uh, the open system that we're analyzing. Okay, 24, uh, pretty straightforward airflow in a pipe. Oh, 20, 24, there is a little bit more to it, uh, I guess. And by the way, these are the, uh, the English, pro the uh, American edition numbers that I'm using here. So, uh, in 24, you just have an airflow in a pipe. And you're supposed to determine the diameter of the pipe. Well, that's not a big deal. You're given the mass flow rate, the conditions of the fluid stream itself. So you can just do an m dot uh, equals v a over v. Keeping your v's straight if you can. And don't forget this is air, so the uh, ideal gas law will apply. What's that V though? Uh, that's yeah, flow speed. And that's the specific volume. And then the other V sometimes use is that for volume. Uh, so that is the volumetric flow rate. The that'd be uh, you know cubic meters per second, that kind of flow flow rate. Uh, but on this one, you're also told to find the rate of flow energy, and that's that's the uh, m dot p v. Notice 
this. This is a little small W. This now has the M dot in it, so it's the big W with the dot because it's a flow rate. So that's all you're supposed to find on number 24, and it says find the rate of flow energy. The rate of energy transport by mass. Uh, we don't really have a specific symbol for that, but maybe we could use that. That's nothing but m dot e, which of course is m dot h uh, plus p e plus k e. And uh, p e, I don't think you even have to worry about. It's not. Uh, it's not significant here. Plus, remember, you can pick the reference for potential energy anywhere you want. Um, on this problem, H is uh, a little tougher to come up with unless you remember that it's just Cp times the temperature. Just like delta H is Cp delta T, uh, H is Cpt. Students sometimes seem to forget that one. When you do this one, the last part of the problem says um, the error involved in part C, which is this, if the kinetic energy is neglected, all you have to do on that one is see that this is much smaller than is that. And it, it comes out, it's, it's less than 1%, so it's a very, very small error uh, keeping that in. Okay, problem 30 is an adiabatic nozzle, air in an adiabatic nozzle. You already know what adiabatic means. Air. Remember means you can apply the uh, ideal gas law as needed. So that's uh, that one's a, a matter of, of finding the uh, find the, the 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 flow properties at the inlet and the outlet. And there's not anything particularly tricky to that one other than remembering what adiabatic means. Thirty-five is uh, thirty-five is also a nozzle. Uh, just one you have to do on E, so uh, it's pretty straightforward. There's not much more to it than that. Thirty-five, forty-one. Forty-one is very much the same as the others. It's a diffuser with uh, refrigerant 134A as the working fluid. Refrigerant 134A is just uh, a very typical syst uh, fluid used usually for refrigerant refrigeration systems. We're going to see that power plants and refrigeration systems are very, very closely related to each other both in in uh, analysis and in construction in some ways. Um, refrigerant 134A is in the back of the book and the tables uh, and the tables are exactly like the steam tables. There's nothing more to learn about. Uh, nothing, no other, no other technique you need to read those than what we learned with the steam tables, the saturated and superheat and conven condensed liquid tables. So it's, it's pretty, uh, hopefully, pretty straightforward then. Uh, 50 turbines and compressors. Oh, that's an ease one, so you're reconsidering the problem before. And on this one, uh, remember turbines. take high energy inlet fluid of some kind. This one happens to be steam. So you're given the pressure 
and the temperature of the inlet as well as the velocity. Six megapascals, 400 degrees C. And the inlet velocity, which generally is a hint that the kinetic energy uh, is going to be significant to the problem. It may or may not. And then the outlet conditions are also given. P2 is 40. Notice the pressure generally drops an, an awful lot through a turbine. Uh, that's part of where the energy comes from. You're given that the quality is 92%. So there is a bit of liquid in that. And then the velocity is 50 meters per second. So uh, that could be a, a big part of just the specific volume being much less once you have some condensation going on. Uh, but it, all, of course, also has to do with the inlet and outlet areas. So you're given all those, oh, plus a mass flow rate, 20 kilograms per second through the, through the system. And that de-energizing of the fluid stream results in work in the form of the uh, turning shaft of the of the turbine, and that then might be connected to a uh, a generator. Uh, you might connect it to a grindstone to grind your corn on the farm. Yeah, you know, whatever for whatever purpose it serves. Uh, you're supposed to find the change in kinetic energy. Yeah, not a big deal. It's practically right there in the. And bite me on the nose. Uh, you need to find the power output. That's the W dot. Remember, power is uh, a flow rate of uh, the rate at which work is produced or consumed. And you're supposed to find the turbine inlet area. So I propose you work on those a little bit while we're here on that one. We, we step through that one a little bit. Because you haven't done it yet, have you? That's what the weekend after next is for. Crunch time. Oh, you do crunches? <laughs> oh. <You> can't tell. <laughs> <laughs> I do every day. Alan, your ex-friend said that. <laughs> okay. And then with these, especially if you're doing them in ease, and this is one to do in ease, uh, because this is it's actually problem 49 that's assigned, but it says redo 40. It's 50 that's assigned, it says redo 40. And it says let the exit pressure vary. Um, from 20 to, no, sorry, 10 to 200. So you can see what the uh, what the output power output is uh, graphed against the exit pressure. So you're supposed to produce that, that kind of graph. Um, I recommend to you uh, do the um, property plot as well on these when you do these on these. But do this for just this particular pressure outlet, then all you have to do is put it into ease and do a parametric table with the inlet or the exit pressures going through that range. Can you show us how to do that property plot? Yep. Yeah. Again, you mean? Yeah. Again, 
again, you win. I think everyone else screws up. What? Not everyone screwed it up. On the test. Everyone. Several volunteered to screw it up and did. Okay. Well, anyway, you you work on this one because it'll take me a couple minutes to uh, get something ready. Um, is this supposed to be V sub 2 equals 50 meters per second? Oh, yeah, 2 here. Of course, that's where it is. Now the, the, the 2 end. How come you let him get that, Alan? It looked like it said 50. It said V1. Yeah, I wrote V2 over here. I'm just getting used to knowing what you're what you mean. Okay. Good. As soon as you do, let me know. I don't know if I have any <coughs> Yeah. Okay.
since just day one. And uh, we kind of kind of cheap. Right. As you start doing these problems, kind of pay attention to the efficiency of doing them. You have to go into the tables to get V1. If you've thought about it ahead of time a little bit, you'll know you're going to need H1. You might as well get it at the same time. Just save yourself the trouble of having come back to the table later, especially since it's unfortunately easy enough to accidentally uh, go to the wrong table.
I don't know if I can get it all on the board or on the screen at once. What is the formula? When you're using the quality to find that. For H2, since we are under the dome, you use HF plus X2 H. FG. Essentially, what you're doing is placing yourself along the, the line under the dome at the 92% point, which is going to be way over tight here because it's not linear across it. The quality does not vary linearly across uh, under the dome. Remember what that term HFG is? It's the difference between those two. Wait, why does it not vary? Because because it doesn't. The, it has to do with the uh, high difference in energy content of the vapor over the liquid. Um, if you remember from chemistry, the latent heat of vaporization. The fact that the temperature and pressure haven't changed, but the fact it's gone from liquid to vapor means there's an awful lot more energy in the vapor than there is the gas and and uh, so it's going to be all these the constant quality lines go some down. So they're, they're uh, percent quality is still going to put you way over here to the right. If that was a, a mass line, which I don't know how to do that, uh, it would be more like right in the middle. But even the volume ones are heavily swayed to that side. So HF and HFG are just right there by convenience. HFG is already available for you. VFG isn't. You have to do that manually. But if you're in a hurry, you just neglect VF anyway. Which is why it's not done there for you. If you're that lazy, just skip it. Get somebody in and do some real work.
remember the, a little bit of difference in some of these. They're doing okay.
We okay? Are we getting the right enthalpy under the dome? You must be if you're getting the right uh, work. You're just getting right in the book there. And then 
do the same thing for point two. What's uh, oh, the pressure for point two? That's given, right? 40 kilopascals. And then the enthalpy at point two, I'll trust you for. Okay, so now we've got those two available and maybe you come up with those through the ease call. Well, that would be the best way to do it. It doesn't make sense to look them up in the book and then just stick them in. Ease will look them up for you. And then that, that you're going to need, as you change this pressure for your graph, this uh, H2 is going to change. So you want ease to look that up automatically as you run through the parametric table. But then to get those two points on the plot, and we have pH and pH for the two plots, we go to plot now, overlay plot, and it asks us what we want to overlay. Um, why isn't P and H? I didn't even have P and T and P. Did you have to maybe run it one time to solve? Maybe, it? yeah, maybe do. Maybe there's nothing to, to solve actually. See, it does put them in the array table. Now let's see, plot overlay plot. Yeah, there we go. So we want H on the x-axis and P on the y-axis. Values from the array table. You can graph from other places. Uh, we don't happen to have any other place, but if when you run the second part of this. You will have a parametric table, and you can plot from there if you want. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to do that on a property plot. Uh, you're going to want to pl plot the, the results from that, not put those on the property plot. Generally, click Automatic Update. That way, if you change any of these values, the graph will change too. It's not uncommon to rerun a program and not realize that the way you're viewing the results isn't changing, and so you're still using old values. Also, put the array indices on each of the dots. That's going to be very important when we get to a power plant analysis, when we have four points at a minimum, and depending on how far we get through that, we could have as many as uh, 20 or 30 points. I don't think we'll get that far. Uh, but if somebody's into it, I'm happy to help you with that. Um, uh, typically, uh, if we connect two state points with a solid line, that implies that we know it's going that path. Remember, an awful lot of what we do here is very much path dependent. If we don't know what path it's going to actually take, we just know where it starts and finishes, we we'll usually put a dotted line in there. I like the little square thing, it shows up a little better. Uh, we already have blue on the graph, so I'll do red for the dot. And we say OK, and there's our two state points there. So it's a matter of using, uh, getting the values in an array table, using plot overlay, and then uh, making sure that you've got those uh, set right. And if you want to go dress it up then a little bit, you can uh, change the colors so they match the, uh, the dot. And make all kinds of cool things. Oh, it. What? So how do you get that plot? To get that plot, then you're going to need to, well, I can't, I can't really show you unless I run the whole, write the whole program. But uh, basically what you need to do is uh, set up a parametric table and you'll have a one column will be this pressure range that you set up as input. Make sure that that pressure is not set in the equations as well. It can be set in the equations or in the parametric table but not in both. Um, I guess I can do it with this because I do have uh, so it's supposed to be on the exit temperature. So I'll just set up a one column uh, parametric table. And uh, you, you can set it to, uh, 
go from 10 to 200. If you just put the numbers in, uh, it's kind of ugly, but it's still going to do what you need it to do. What we need is this graph. We don't necessarily need a pretty parametric table, but if you were writing a report and that was part of it, you'd want to clean these numbers up by either adding or subtracting runs or changing the uh, first or last point or by setting the, the parametric table in some other way. And then when you want to graph, you go to plot, um, new XY plot. I don't have XY values, but that's what you do. You do a new XY plot. Uh, notice I only have P2. If I had uh, W dot, I just choose it here on the Y axis, and then it's a matter of uh, dressing things up a little bit if you need to. Notice that the uh, input now includes the parametric table. Uh, you can graph out of the arrays table. I don't know how much sense that would make. But you can. Okay? Alright, let's spend two more minutes together. Where are you going for spring break? Some Caribbean island, I'm sure, to see Dimitri. <laughs> Anybody going someplace cool? It won't be on a video later. It's cool in here. It's cool in New York. Yeah, man. Cool as it comes.